Greetings. Today's video is going to be on traditional sword training. Here at the United States Nippo Academy, uh, we have a few sections on Kukishinru Biken Jitsu and Togakuru Ninja Biken Jitsu. Today I'm going to talk about some of the basics of Kenjutsu, including the Kamais, the way that we cut, the way that we block. Before I start, I'd like to say that people have come to me from all over the place over the last 30 years, and some people have had traditional sword training. And traditional sword training uh, is very detail-oriented. So for those who watch this video who train strictly in a sword school, um, please don't send me a thousand videos saying that my belt wasn't tied right, my gi wasn't worn right, uh, I was two inches low on this and a quarter inch low on that. Or, you know, I know you guys are very detail oriented and I, I respect you for it. But these are the basics that my students need um, and these are low level belts. These are yellow belt, orange belt uh, sections in a test that's going to teach them basically how to grip the sword, how to, how to walk with it, the kamais or stances that are required, what those stances mean, how to cut from them, and how to block. Those are the basics they're going to learn under green belt. So today I'd like to make a video to show my students and anyone out there some of the basics on Kenjutsu and how they're applied in the info school. Thank you. So to get started, basically Kenjutsu is the art of the Japanese sword. Starting with a Shinken, or an actual live blade weapon, down to a training blade that is a Japanese or, or a metal steel blade that has no sharp edge on it that you can practice with people or practice with yourself safely, the training tool. Next you have what they call boken or bokuto. These are wooden variations of a metal sword. Again, for training purposes, developing strength, developing accuracy, and for combat training as safe as possible. And then you actually have something called a, a Fukuro Shinai. This is a bamboo type weapon that can be used as a sword and also trained even safer than training with a wooden weapon. So those are the variants of it. Right? When you're talking about a, a sword, a traditional sword, uh, I've included a list of all the different parts and you can get that a thousand different places. But some of the things that are important for you to understand is on the grip, right? Um, the etiquette of it is that as you take the sword off of the, of the rack, you're gonna take the sword off the rack and you're gonna face, uh, you're gonna face a, a shrine area or a kamidano or you know, a, a specific spot and you're gonna bow in, making sure that the blade, the sharp part of the blade is facing towards yourself. You're gonna bow in, say, I wanna get you on this. In many cases, you're going to carry the sword in your right hand because the right hand is the side that you would be drawing from. So you have the sword in your right hand with the sword facing away from you is how you would carry it. Traditionally, you would carry the blade closest to the wall if you're walking around inside of a room. You would never carry it in your right hand with the blade because this is the side that you could actually draw the blade from. So your right hand is traditionally what all swordsmen are using. You're gonna keep the blade in your right hand as a side of respect, stating that you cannot draw it because all swordsmen draw with their right hand. The thumb is placed over top of the suba here, and that's basically used as a lock, just to make sure that the sword doesn't fall out or someone can't grab it and pull it from you. So that's a safety factor, right? So that's some of the basics of just carrying it and handling it. If you ever had to handle the sword to someone, again, you would put the blade towards yourself and you would hold it out and wait for them to take it up out of your hand. Another way to do it is just to present them with your hands open to allow them to strictly just take the blade from you. So that's some of the basics on the etiquette of actually handling the blade, bowing with the blade, bowing with the partner, or handing a blade to someone properly. That's some of the basic etiquette of using the sword. Now we're going to talk about the actual grip of the sword. Just removing it from the scabbard. The grip of the sword needs to be with the V part of your hand on top of the sword. So you don't grab the sword from the side. And you grab the sword from the top. So both of the V's of your hand are lining up down the blade. Okay? 
So what you're doing is you're taking the V crook of your hand and putting that in line so both Vs are matching and your palms are almost on top of the actual blade. So if I was here, it's almost laying my hand straight down on top of it and letting my fingers curl around it. Same thing with the back hand. The V is going to be on top of it and then the fingers are going to curl around it. Right? I'm going to have some space between my hands. Right? And this is generally referred to as the dragon's mouth with the space between the hands. I'm going to have pretty good grip with my three index fingers, ring finger and pinky finger. My pointer finger is going to be relaxed. Keeping that relatively relaxed, that's going to give me the versatility that I need to move the sword around. So that is the basic grip of the sword. And this grip stays the same no matter what kama you're in, no matter what stance I'm in, this grip is going to be staying the same. Okay? So that's very important as far as the grip is concerned. The next section is going to be how to draw the blade. Being able to draw the blade is very important. There's many ways to do it. In Nympho, traditionally, it's a straightforward draw. First, you're going to take the sword on your left side and push it down through your belt. You want to have it to where it's in the belt and balanced. And the belt's tight enough so the blade doesn't wobble. Drawing a sword is more like removing the scabbard from the blade than taking the blade out of the scabbard. And what I mean by that just basically is you're going to take the scabbard itself and remove the scabbard as you turn your body to clear the blade from the scabbard. And that's going to produce your draw. And then in return, when you put the sword back, you're going to put the sword back where you're actually going to replace the scabbard over top of the blade. Okay? So there's not a lot of pulling the blade. It's more of pulling the scabbard and turning the body, which produces the blade from being put on, pulled out. So on a basic way is if you start from kind of the Shizen position. Again, this is fundamental basics. Stepping and opening your leg some and pushing the blade actually forward. So you're almost in like a karate style horse stance. So the left leg is going to open and the blade is going to come forward. From this position here, you're going to learn to pull the scabbard backwards as you step back with your left leg, turning your hips. And by doing that, the blade comes free. Bringing the blade straight forward allows me to get into a stance. Pull this forward, push it behind your back, and catch the blade with both hands again. Now, to put the sword away, I'm going to bring the scabbard back in front, and it's very important that this area of the scabbard is tight. You don't want to be grabbing it here. You want your hand to be over top of the actual scabbard. Okay. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to bring this up almost until it's touching my shoulder. And I have it very tight with my hand, almost where I can pinch it with these fingers. And I'm going to let this slide down as I pull up, straight up. Now right there, right there, you feel the tip pull through. When that happens, my right hand rises up, my left hand falls down. Now the blade is actually inside the scabbard. I'm going to start to push forward to make sure that it's safe, that everything is good. Once I have it starting to move forward, I'm going to bring my back left leg forward and bring this up. And at the very end, a small pull, keeping my thumb out so the thumb touches the scabbard. That's kind of a safety mechanism right there. So the thumb is on the scabbard and there is a space between the blade. It's not fully closed. Some people can put it on this side, I keep it on this side here. Right, so that's that. So once I come back to that position here, and see, then this hand comes to the top. Once I'm in this position here, then I'm going to ease off with my left thumb and let the blade close and then lock it down and then bring this hand down. Right? So step one 
is actually pushing forward some, or step one is actually breaking the lock, using that same thumb push to open the seal of the blade. That's very important too, as I just mentioned. The thumb is used to push open the lock, and you want to be able to do that as secretly as possible. So you want to have that done very naturally. Right? I don't know if anybody noticed that I did it while I was talking, but it just very naturally you want that to have open. You don't want that to be something that is obvious that you've done. So that breaking the seal and moving the sword forward is a little bit obvious. Then next you're going to simply step back, pulling the blade free, going into Kamai. And once in Kamai, bringing the scabbard back, making it tight, bringing this forward, pull down and up, then down and in, and then stepping to the thumb. Here, when it's safe, proper zakshin, close, lock, set. So that's the whole process of being able to remove the blade I'm attacked and I have the blade here. I'm attacked. This allows me to be able to move. So even though I'm putting my sword away, I want to make sure that at any time I can still attack from that position. Some sword schools or many sword schools, they'll do it sideways across their belt. And that's okay. That's fine. But in Nimpo, or at least with what I'm teaching in United States Nimpo Academy, I want your initial draw not to be a draw that comes out sideways. I want your initial draw to be something that casts forward, casts forward, forward here, right? And then the same thing when you bring it back, I want everything to be lined in that same forward motion here, like that. So that's the basic sword draw, right? One more time. That's the basic sword drum. There's many other ones that we'll get into later on down the road where you'll learn to actually you know, pull the blade and draw to your right, to your left. Um, there's, there's going to be techniques where you're, you're going to learn how to draw the blade as you turn and cut. Um, there's different ways we're going to be able to do that. But until you've got this initial draw where you can come straight out and then being able to put the sword away properly, keep everything straight. I don't want you to move forward until we get all that down. Thank you. Greetings. As I mentioned earlier, there's two different types of sword schools that we study here. Number one is Kukishinru. Kukishin is generally a samurai-based system. That has a beacon jutsu sword system. The second one is Togakuriru. That is a ninja system, a ninja toe. So, Briefly, I'd just like to talk about the two differences. <clears throat> so basically what I have here is two swords. These are the Bokuto versions. They look relatively similar. Relatively similar in length, size, just some small differences. On the Kukishinru side, which is here, 
you can see that the blade is like this. And then on the Togoppe Ru side, the blade is here. So you can see the differences in the two blades. This, the handles are relatively the same size, but the blades themselves are shorter. This is the Togoppe Ru version, smaller blade. One of the misconceptions is that the ninja sword was straight. The ninja sword, or in fact most Japanese swords, are never straight. The strength comes in its ability to have a slight curve to it. Basically, the ninja toe is a specialized sword, but in many cases is just a samurai sword where the end part of it, the end part of it, has been removed. The weakest part of a blade is in this section right here because it's the thinnest. This is actually the cutting edge of it. So this thin, weaker blade, because many times that ninja would use this as a tool, climbing tool, setting traps, used for building things, um, shelter buildings, this, this is climbing walls. There was many things that this, so the blade itself had to be as strong as possible. By reducing the size of it, you're gonna give it the strength, is, the strongest part of the blade is going to be here, the weakest part is going to be removed. Also, you're going to reduce the weight of it. You're also going to leave room in the scabbard at the very bottom, which you can carry messages, you can carry food, you can put lining powders in there. Uh, it can be a space for utility. So the blade itself was shorter to give the ninja strength, speed, and agility. But it sacrificed the length so the ninja had to be able to get in a closer distance. So what I'm going to be showing you today is the kamais from the Kukishinru side. The Kukishinru side. The basics of just Kenjutsu in general. Not specific to any Ruha, just basic fundamental skills that a student of Nimpo or Japanese Kenjutsu student is going to need to know. So that is the difference between a regular katana. And this is actually longer, uh, the Kukishinru blade is actually longer uh, than a traditional sword or a traditional katana. So this is a Bokuto that's very accurate that represents the Kukishin blade. This is a Bokuto that represents the size of a ninja toe. I believe this is about 21 inches in length, the blade itself. With the traditional katana, it was anywhere from six to eight inches longer, and this is even more. Plus you can notice that the handle itself, the handle itself is a little bit wider, which gave you a little bit more room to move your arms around because it is a longer blade. But that is the difference between a togaku ru or a ninja sword, which is not straight. It's a regular katana, which is the end cut off, which makes it look straighter, but it's still a curved blade to the traditional samurai katana. Here. So that's the difference between the two swords. Next is going to be the kamai section. Going to use a wooden vocal tone. Nothing changes. When you draw the vocal tone, the same principles apply. No matter if you're using a katana or a regular vocal tone, the principles stay the same. Okay? So, first, the kamai is Sega no kamai. So we're gonna start from a sword draw each time to show that repetition over and over, showing how to draw into the kamais and practicing the resheathing over and over and over. Okay. So the first is Sega no kamai. So you start with your traditional draw, and then Sega no kamai is having that hand put on top, and the sword itself is going to be one fist from your hip, in line with your hip and your body is going to be here, okay? So what, what mistake many people make is, you see how this is straightforward. Many people use Sega no Kamai and the sword is in center of their belly, right? The blade is off to the side and the body is turned sideways and the sword is coming up here. I don't wanna have the sword out in front of my belly because it gives them a place to turn. If I thrust or I move, I want my body between the blade, right? The tip of itself is going to be I love, okay? I love. Sega no Kumar. I love. Here. Sega no Kumar. Sega. Then 
to put it away. Forward. Sega no Kamui. Next, Ichi no Kamui. <clears throat> For Ichi no Kamui, the same draw, but now the blade is going to put up into the eyes, straight out, eye level. Okay? So from Seigan, it's pushing the blade forward here. Right? Keeping your shoulders always down and keeping your elbows always in. Ichi no Kamui is here. Seigan, here. Sega Ichi no Kamui. Okay. So <clears throat> you can imagine your opponent is maybe in Sega and steps back into a higher stance. What you can do with this here is move in to close that space, pointing into their eyes, into their eyes. So Ichi no Kamui has that feeling. Ichi no Next is Chude no Kamai. Chude no Kamai is the middle level stance. So again, drawing the blade free, this time from Seigan, drop it straight down, horizontal to the ground. Again, <laughs> it's coming off to the side of your body. It's not out in your stomach area, it's here. Chude no Kamai. Chude no Kamai. Chude. Shoulders are down, elbows are in, relaxed. Geda no Kamai. Geda no Kamai is pointing down to the opponent's feet. The top of his foot is called the toki. Again, from the draw, just continue the draw. We are actually pointing down to the opponent's foot. Here. Pointing down. Okay. Shoulders are down, elbows are in. Still have my proper grip on the top. Next, Tenchi no Kamai. Tenchi no Kamai is mistakenly called Hasono Kamai for many purposes, but maybe Hasono Kamai is proper in other systems. But <clears throat> in Kukushinru, uh, Tenchi is the proper position. Haso Kesagiri is the cut that's done, and the Kamai itself is called Tenchi no Kamai. And Tenchi no Kamai is basically pulling out and coming up to the side. Making sure that the sword itself is in front of your temple, in front of your face. It's not pulled back with the elbow up or down. It's here. Okay? The legs, I'm not so much worried about the legs right now. Generally, we should stay in stance and come up. Yet, I have seen it tight in this straight position. But in the beginning level, I prefer to be in come up and making sure that the blade is straight. So you don't have any angle on it, and it doesn't have any angle this way or here. It's straight up and down. <clears throat> and this right hand is about one fist from the bottom. And we're in Kamai. Tenchi no Kamai.
you might just hurt some people by going left side. Don't worry about that. But you do have to eventually be able to do both sides when you do the comeback. But for now, <laughs> the primary right side is all needed for testing. The next kamai is called Kasumi no kamai. So Kasumi no kamai, Kasumi, generally the temple, the temple there, uh, means mist, type of feeling, the fall, the confusion. But for Kasumi no kamai, once you do your initial draw, you're in Sega, you're gonna come back. The blade is now pointing up, so the top part of the blade is pointing up. My hands are crossed. The blade is temple high. I want to be able to use the blade because it's a mirrored surface to be able to see what's around my back, what is up in the trees, or what is down on the ground. So in many cases, if I'm in a kamai, I'm going to go to Kasumi no Kamai, which is going to allow me to have 360 degree view around my body. Either physically what I can see with my own eyes, or what I can see in a reflective surface of the blade. But from Sega no Kamai, the right foot is going to step back, and the, the hands are going to cross, and the blade is going to come up to the temple area. Right? My right fist is directly in line, one fist away from my face. So you see, my right fist is in line with my head. So my hands are not pulled way back, or my hands are not out in front, it's not over top of my head, or it's not down by my neck. My right hand is brought up one fist away from my face. Hantai, the hands don't cross in Hantai. But again, now my right hand is still by my temple. And I'm here. I switch, it crosses. Blade is up. So you sheath. The last kamai is Jora no kamai. Jora no kamai. It's also known as Daijura no kamai. For Jora no kamai, same draw, and then this is going to come above the head on a 45 degree angle. Right? 45 degree angle. See the 45 degree angle. And my elbows are in, and my shoulders are down, and I'm looking through that space there. Right? And the blade has to be straight. If you have your grip correctly, where the V's are lined up on top of the hand, when you bring both your hands above your head, with your elbows relaxed and your shoulders relaxed, the sword will be straight. What you don't want to have happen is to be any angle above your head. Okay? You want it to be straight above your head. Straight. Straight above your head. And about 45 degree angles going out. Too far back is not correct. Too far straight up is not correct. 45 degrees is there. This will also hide a little bit of how long the blade is. And by keeping it straight in line, it's going to make the blade look very narrow. If I have on any angle, my opponent can see how long my blade is, and maybe he can use that against me. So once I pull my blade out, boom, and I go back to come up, I'm trying to deceive how long this is and I'm here. Plus I want it on a straight line, so when I cut, it's as quick as possible. Okay, quick. So again, join. And then we see. So once again, do all of them come out quick. <sighs> Sega. Ichi. Chura. Gera. Tenchi. Kasumi. Jono. If you notice, my right foot is full for Sega, Ichi, Chura, Gera. 
My left foot comes forward for Tenchi, Kasumi, and Jodan. The next section is on the cuts. These are the basic seven cuts. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate each one of the cuts. The seven. You're going to start in Jodan no Kamai. From Jodan no Kamai, you're going to cut with a slight Keza angle or number one. You're going to step back with your left foot, step forward with your right, and you're going to cut. Having the sword stop at about knee height. As a rule of thumb, stopping at about the knee height is the safest, most effective way to cut. So again, slightly on an angle, cutting knee high. The next is going to be dough. I'm going to bring the sword up to this tenchi position, stepping back with my right foot, cutting dough by stepping with my left. And I'm going to rock as I go to Tenchi Okamai, and I'm going to cut true Kasagiri, right to left. Rock back to Kamai, switch feet, cut down this side. From here, I'm going to do something called Gyakugeira, where I'm going to rock back and flip this here, behind me, like this. I'm going to step up and cut the opposite of that angle. Rocking back, stepping. Cutting up, switching my feet, ski, and stepping back to the position to start again. So it's basically inch, knee, so, she, go, rope, zitch, back up. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, back. Once you cut the first one, and the second one, third, fourth, this is where I see a lot of people make the mistake. Rocking back and getting the momentum. I'm cutting up on an angle, and I'm letting this pull and push to flick that forward. And you notice that the sword is along my arm. So it's not below or above, it's in long. And I'm almost grounding that like a shackle bow to my hip. I'm almost pulling that to my own forearm when I cut up. Same thing here. My left hand is tucked in, grounded on my right forearm on that hasogyaku cut. So it's turning up, cutting, cutting. So hitting lower ribs, cutting through. But it's very important that whatever angle you cut down on, when you reverse that, that same angle as you're cutting up. So if we did all seven cuts, you'd have one cut coming slight angle. The next cut, cutting right in head. Then cutting down. Then cutting down. Now I'm going to cut back up that exact same angle. Cut up the other angle. Now everything has a vortex of cuts. I'm going to ski to that dead center of cuts. And then back to Kamai. And then from there, you can come to Reho positions. Here. All right. But those are the seven cuts. The next section is on Ukemi Kihon, basically ways to block with the sword. So let's get started. Generally, Sega no Kamai 
is a very good defensive position with the sword. To be able to block, you want to use the thickest, strongest part of the blade, the back part of the blade. This is where the metal is the thickest, this is where the sword is the strongest. During your blocking, you want to protect the actual cutting edge, the hamon, the actual cutting sharp, the thin razor side of it. It's the weakest end. So when you're blocking, you don't want to take the weakest end and point that towards your opponent. You want to take the stronger back end and point that to your opponent. To do that, you have to do a small adjustment on the actual wrist itself. Don't gooseneck the wrist too much where it comes weak. It's more of just slightly on an angle. You're going to accent the angle of your wrist by also changing the direction of your body. And you're going to be using the strength of your arms and your entire core balance. So it's not just hitting with the actual sword itself, it's using your entire body to block. So if I'm going to be blocking something that's coming in to my, my uh, left side <clears throat> from Kamai, I'm actually going to use my right side to block an attack coming from my left. So I'm going to step with my right foot out and I'm going to push with my right arm to turn this and block it. So I'm twisting this slightly to put it blocked. This hand here is dead straight center from the inside of my body and I'm pushing out with my arms and my weight is down. So again, it's going to be one. Going the other direction, if it's coming in from my right side, I'm going to use my left foot and I'm going to turn it out again. But again, my right hand is dead center, pushing out with my body and the wrist is turning. The blade is turning something. So again, it's turning one, two. Okay? And I'm using this to strikefully hit, block, turning my body. My upper body does not want to lean too much. I don't want to lean so much with my body. I want to keep my body as straight as I can on these blocks. Using my arms and my core positioning to use this strength to block. And I don't want to actually push too far. I just want to actually deflect this and greet it. When I block. So it's moving across my body like this. And I'm using my weight transfer to do this. Right? To block low, we're going to do the same principle, except we're going to drop the blade. So if it's coming in to my left, again I'm going to use my right. I'm going to drop, push this down on an angle. Again, turning the back part of the blade into the block. Generally, if they're attacking, they're attacking with the edge. They're attacking with the thinnest, weakest part of their blade. And I'm blocking the thickest, strongest part of my blade. So coming from the left, I use my right to step out, push with my arms, and block. If it's coming to my right, I step with my left, I push with my arms, and I block. Making sure that when I block, the blade is on the outside of my leg. That I'm not just lowering this down and leaving this here. Real quickly, same thing with Gei Naruke. I want to make sure that when I'm moving my body and blocking, that this block is on the outside of my leg, so I'm not just dropping my hand down and still getting kicked on my side of my body. This is clear. Same exact principle with the sword, making sure that when I move, it's clear. It's clearing to the outside of my body. And again, my body stays straight. So I'm not leaning. I mean, there is definitely times to where you may have to lean, especially if it's a Yori or a Naginata, and they're moving quickly. But that is only you compensating for your lack of skill. We do this correctly, we keep our spine straight, using the blade and pushing this free. No matter if it's low, or if it's hot, making sure that our spine stays straight, right? So that's four. So this is one, two, three, four. Okay? The fifth one is for attack coming straight down. From Sagan, the same thing is, I'm going to step forward and turn and bring the blade above. 
almost like a shaku ball, but here, my right hand is one fist above my head. I'm stepping full and rotating. So the back thick part of the blade is still here. But when the blade comes forward, I have my cutting edge on my opponent. So it looks like this. One, and cut. Either direction, making sure that the back part of the blade is being rotated. And you have to self-check yourself to see if that's rotating. You'll know quickly when you come forward is the blade facing your opponent. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. So, all five blocks. Beach, beef, so, she, go. So those are the five blocks. The last section I have to go over is chibari. Chibari is basically removing blood or tossing blood from your blade <clears throat> so after you've done some type of a cut and there is blood on your blade chibari is a way to remove that blood before you return the sword back to the scabbard a couple basic ways to do it is once you've once you've cut something is to take your right hand and give the blade one good flip and then punch down on it. That makes the blood drop off. From this position here, you have to be careful to catch your blade upside down <clears throat> to put the blade in this way here. So that may take a little bit of practice. So you basically are in a situation, someone cuts at you, you move off and you cut, hit, and then you go ahead and put the blade away. Another way to do the chibari <clears throat> is once you've done some type of cut, is basically turning it almost on that same blocking angle with one hand or with two but basically with one hand and giving time for gravity to start letting the blood run from the top down some swords will actually have what they call a blood groove in them which is also done to reduce the weight but it will catch some of that blood or rain or water in it and once that starts to move basically taking that and throwing it down <clears throat> generally throwing it down either on the opponent that you just cut or in some cases throwing it down on the ground making a line of blood that an opponent has to cross to attack you as a psychological aspect once i've cut them and i'm starting someone's starting to move towards me if i turn and face them i throw this cheap re blood down and make a line like almost drawing a line in the sand saying i just killed your friend if you think you're man enough step across his blood and you're next so it's a little bit of a psychological thing on the ninja side of it you can actually take that blood and i can flick it into their eyes to make to make them realize the panic that not only do they have something in their eyes that they can't see but it's their best friend's blood that's in their eyes as a deterrent so the chibari can be done a couple ways one a flip hit or once I've cut, rising it on an angle, and then cutting, just flicking everything down. One, two. And then once it's down, again, bringing this straight up and across. Right? Now, obviously, more of a traditional way is I just cut someone down. I can come inside, have a small claw. I can use that and throw it down too. Perfectly simple. You can use the inside of your gi to clear the blood off before putting it away. So if you were in a big battle and you were just constantly cutting through people the whole entire time and now the sun was over, you could do this quickly before you put your blade away. If you had the blood dried up on the inside of it, it can clog it up when you go to draw, it can be kind of slowing you down. So you want the blade as polished and as smooth as possible. So that's the reason for the cheap so you Cut, boom, down, see? cut this is a slight down there's many many ways of doing the chi root but the flip hit and the up down are the two most popular um, one that i use sometimes is 
after I draw and I cut, sometimes you can come here with it. And bring it across. Bring it. So that is out. I cut here, cuts and rolls. Right? Here, cuts and rolls. That way, right? So once I cut down, <laughs> this is coming down like that. It's another way. Like roll. I let it continue to roll, and you've got to flip it through your fingers. Right? So there's no way that I can do this slow. Maybe I can do it slow and then slow it down. 